Before we start the program, we would like to share a few housekeeping items. First, this program is being recorded. The recording will be posted on ambard.org forward slash careers within seven business days. You will receive an email after the program with a copy of the PowerPoint and handout next week. The PowerPoint and handout is available for download in the webinar control panel now. The audience is joining this webinar in listen only mode. You can submit text questions via the questions pane of the webinar control panel. We will address as many questions as we can today. Finally, at the end of the webinar, please complete our short survey. Hello everyone and welcome to the Career Advice Series webinar, Alternative Careers, Pouring Over Your Next Career. I am Emily Roshak, Director of ABA Legal Career Central, a career center that offers both career development resources and a job board for law students, lawyers, and other legal professionals across all disciplines and career stages. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Cheryl Rich Heisler. Cheryl is the president and founder of Law Alternatives, a career consulting company designed to help attorneys at all stages of their careers rethink and reevaluate their career options, whether inside or outside of the law. Previously, she practiced corporate law at Catton Mushin Davis in Chicago and left the law to practice brand management with Kraft Incorporated. She regularly speaks at law schools and bar associations and has been interviewed or quoted in numerous media channels. She is a board member of ABA Legal Career Central. Cheryl, thanks so much for being here today. I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Emily. Welcome, everybody. Uh, for those people who are listening to this in the future, it is a beautiful day in Chicago. The sun is shining. The streets are clear. But for those people who are really with us today, you should know it's a mess. Chicago's under close to a foot of snow. The ABA is actually closed. And uh, we're all doing these programs now remotely in our in our bunny slippers. So it is a crazy day, but it's a wonderful day to talk about careers. Thank you, Emily and Tracy, for uh, putting in extra time and doing this above and beyond. And now let's, let's get going. Um, uh, we'll go to our first slide, and we're going to talk about something I'm very proud of, which is, uh, let's wait till we, can we go? There we go. Uh, not my um, uh, bar passage degree. That's very important to me, and that's also up in my office. But this is the proof of my attendance at the American Professional Bartender School, hence the play on words that we're going to talk about, pouring over your next career. Uh, this is something that reminds me every day that part of work is about having fun. And part of what I really want to impress upon all of you listeners today is that work can be fun and finding alternative careers should be fun because it's about doing something that you love. Uh, the mix of people who are attending this seminar, and, and I don't even mean to make a pun with the word mix, is fantastic. I was talking earlier with uh, the staff members that I feel very vindicated. Today, listening live, we, uh, judging by the demographics. We have law students with less than one year of experience, maybe have only clerked, to retired attorneys who are thinking about second careers. We have attorneys from big and small firms, attorneys who are in in-house positions, attorneys who work for the government, even some attorneys who have already started working in an alternative or a JD equivalent kind of role who want to learn more about career advice. We have just about every state represented on this call today. And I am really thrilled that you're all here. And I'm reminded again that this, I won't call it a problem, but this issue of what else can you do with a law degree is a very broad one. And it affects a lot of people. And there are a ton of people asking that question. I have a couple of goals for this seminar today. Uh, one, I've already mentioned, I want you to have fun. We're going to use a lot of uh, wordplay. We're going to use a lot of reference to my mixology hobby, just really as a jumping off point for the more serious talk about career change. Uh, but I also want to make sure that you learn something. If, in fact, you spend an hour with me today and you didn't learn one new thing, 
I want to hear about it because then I haven't done my job. I find that too often people will spend time networking or talking or listening or going to seminars and don't take away one learning. And, you know, that's my my very serious motto. If you're going to spend the time, get something out of it. So I want you to get something out of it today. This will not be your typical law webinar, um, but we are going to learn a lot and we're going to have some fun. One of the things that I want to mention while we're still on the uh, slide showing my proud uh, passage rate and, and the first dollar I ever earned for mixology is that what I like to do is not going to be the same thing you like to do. How I spend my free time in behind a bar may not interest you in the least, but my story should interest you because everybody has their own story and everyone who's listening today should be thinking about what their own path is, what their own interests are, what their own passions are, what their own areas of curiosity are, so that when you hear me talk about, well, how I got to the mixology path, you start to think, hmm, I don't want to do that, but maybe I love animals, or maybe I love finance, or maybe I think that banking is just the coolest industry. That's okay, because all of this, as we'll learn later on in the program, starts with an introspection, a self-assessment a questioning uh, look into the mirror of what do I want to do. So uh, let's move on. Now you know a little bit about my background. And in the next slide, you'll see, again, it's a shameless plug, uh, but I like to encourage people to start small. <laughs> and when I say small, it can be as small as a two by three and a half business card. There's something very uh, legitimizing and very affirming when you see your name on a card. So if you're doing a job search right now and you don't have a business card, make yourself one. Even if you're just a, a new graduate and you don't have uh, a law job to put on there, put your name, put your address, put a JD on there so that when you meet people, you have something tangible to give them. The idea that you can sometimes fake it till you make it came to me from my sister who's an actor. And when she was trying out for roles that she couldn't get, she kept saying, I'll tell them I can play, you know, she's she's mid age, middle age. She says, I can play young, I can play old. You fake that feeling of I can do this till you make it. Now, as you transition, as you learn more about your new industry, as you spend time in this area of interest as a hobby or as a volunteer, you are, of course, going to get and learn some of those real skills. I'm not suggesting that anybody try to move into a new field without background. But I am saying that uh, put your thoughts together, even if it's in as small a uh, design as a business card, and know that you've got something to offer. All right, let's move on. This guy looks like he really knows what he's doing behind the bar. And I'll tell you, I don't know any of these kinds of tricks, but I have my own niche. And it's true with any industry that you're thinking about moving into. Every industry has room for lots of different areas of expertise and specialty. So, for instance, if somebody wanted to be a lawyer and was coming to talk to any of the panelists or any, sorry, any of the attendees, they might say, gee, I don't think I want to go to court, so can I still be a lawyer? And you'd say, of course, right? There are all different kinds of lawyers. Some lawyers go to court. Some lawyers practice transactional law, some lawyers work in the government, you realize that the law isn't just single-minded, single-focused. That's true about any other industry you're going to consider. If you have a, a doodle page next to your notes and you were to draw an archery target, sort of a nice visual, think about the center of that target being the sweet spot. If, I, if somebody said to me, well, gee, I've always been interested in medicine, and I, they said, but you know what, I'm not going to go back to medical school now. I'd draw that same kind of an archery target, and I would put right in the center circle the words doctor. And I'd say, I understand that you don't want to go back to school to become a doctor right now. But think about it. The doctors are not the only part of the archery target called healthcare or medicine. Doctors have to be supported by staff, and the staff has to be supported by let's say, hospital environments, so where it's a place where sick people can go to be seen by the doctors. And the hospitals have people who run everything from how do the uniforms get cleaned, how do the 
how does the equipment get to the hospital, who looks at the legal and ethical issues of people coming into the hospital, who looks at the insurance issues, who deals with the pharmaceutical needs of a hospital organization. And you start to realize that any industry is in fact much broader than that one center spot in the target. Same thing is true if I have a client who comes and says that he or she loves sports. Well, they may not have the pitching arm to take the Cubs to the World Series, but if you made that same archery target, you'd realize that there are pitchers, but then there are eight other guys on the team, and there are coaches, and there are people who do marketing for the teams, and people who do ticket sales for the teams, and people who do other kinds of sales and licensings for the needs of a team like a national team like the like the Cubs a professional team like the Cubs. So anytime you start thinking about where you might want to take your career, before you rule it out because you can't get to the center of the circle, that sweet spot, I want you to think about all the other concentric circles within that industry that relate to the area that you initially thought about. And you'd be amazed at how many places on that target somebody with a legal background just might fit into. Okay, let's move on. Part of the fun of doing something you love, even if it's just part-time, is that it bifurcates your day. I find that there's a lot of joy in variety. And for many of my clients, part of the frustration is the feeling that they're doing the same thing every day, day in and day out. Absolutely, law can be a very intellectually challenging profession. But sometimes if you get very specialized or if you find that you're doing the same kinds of things all the time, you lose that joy. So this slide is just to remind people that, you know what, you can have a work part of your day and you can have a joyful or hobby part of your day. If you're lucky and if you start uh, really listening to yourself as we talk about the self-assessment, you're going to be able to pull those things together so that it becomes a joy both on the work part of your day and the fun part of your day. Another way that I've heard this represented, and I've had clients say that this is really helpful, is you think of anybody who's a well-balanced person, who's pretty happy in what they do, they are probably analogized to a three-legged stool. A, three, a stool with three legs is well-balanced, right? It's not going to topple. And the three legs are the personal component, the work component, and the social component. If you are lucky enough to have a stable work life, a stable personal life, and a stable social support system, you're not going to wobble. But when you find that there's too much weight on the work piece, and many lawyers that I've seen complain to me of this, you realize that you're asking that stool to balance way too heavily on one leg. So one of the things that I can uh, suggest that you do, even as we're talking now, make a little visual of that three-legged stool and ask yourself or jot down whether or not you're balanced between the work piece, the personal piece, and the social piece. And if you're not, uh, listen more, even more carefully to some of the things we're going to say later on. Okay, the next slide shows what I would call the perfect poor or, again, the perfect law candidate. Somebody who's gone to a to an elite school they don't need anything else, right? They've got the grades and they've got the pedigree and a lot of doors might open to them. Now, it may not be the door that they want to go in or the door that's ultimately happy for them, um, but they can just be served up neat, like a really good aged scotch. The problem is that those kinds of perfect pours with candidates and with job match is very rare. Most of us are more like, if we flip the slide, we're more like um, a blend, right, where we've got some combination of a, a decent education, we have a JD, but we have other parts to us. We have other interests. Um, if you think of it, you know, our, our spirit base might be the JD, our mixer, like the juice or the soda, might be something else that we have a particular interest in, a passion for, a hobby, something that we've done even since we were kids, we love to read, we love to talk, uh, we love to ride horses, we love to work for nonprofit. Those are the mixers. And then the garnish is something a little bit unusual that just tops it off. Noting that we can't all be that sort of perfect pour, we don't all have that 
single-minded focus for, um, for the legal work, more of us are like those mixes. And we have to figure out what is the mix between our own skills, our own education, our own background, and our particular interests that make us an interesting candidate. And this is a more complex question, right? It's harder for the person who just came out of Harvard Law, just to use an example, with perfect grades and perfect scores, that person is going to be able to just serve themselves up as, a, you know, take me just the way I am. But when you're a blend, you have to figure out what parts of yourself are you going to market? What parts of yourself are you going to highlight? What is your base spirit? What is your mixer? What is your garnish, if you will? Another way to think about this is that uh, your education, and I'm including your undergraduate background as well as your JD, are sort of the, the spirit part of you, the, the boozy part of you. That's what's going to make establish what the drink is. But the mixers are your interests and your hobbies, and then your technical and, most importantly, your transferable skills are kind of like that garnish on top. So, for instance, let's, let's move to the next slide for a little bit, and, and um, I'm going to make another analogy, and bear with me on the cocktail stuff, guys, because it really does bear out. Look at how if you take a vodka base, right, and depending on what you mix it with, you get a totally different drink. And I don't know how many of you guys are are uh, martini people, but you know that if you add your vermouth and maybe a little bit of olives, right, you've got a nice dirty martini. But it's a very different drink than if you add orange juice to your vodka and get a screwdriver. Let's advance the slide for a second, and I'll make it even clearer. The law is kind of like that base spirit when I think of where people can take their legal skills, right? If you're grounded in the law, but you really have strong persuasive and, and people skills, have you considered that maybe a job in sales would be the best use of tying those two together? What if you're really a quant or management type person? Well, you know, law plus quantitative skills, just like vodka plus a different mixer gets a different drink, law plus quantitative skills maybe offers you the possibility to do a career into the business world. When you think of law plus a, a love of learning and a teaching and training component and an academic kind of curiosity, I've seen lawyers and help lawyers move into the academic world. So again, it's not just the law. We all share that law background, but these other arrows, these other tangents uh, indicate the kinds of additional skills or transferable skills that you might have in in ACEs, right, you have lots and lots of that, but you want to figure out how to use it in your career. The same thing with law and a facility with words. A lot of lawyers move into communication type roles, um, government affairs, public affairs, public policy, lobbying. To me, the background in law plus that facility with words equals the possibility of making a transition into something like a communications role. And the same thing is true if you add a, a passion for giving back. Law is a wonderful background to make some real difference in the not-for-profit community. But think about it. Law plus quant skills doesn't necessarily lead you into not-for-profit. I mean, it might if you have quant skills and that desire to give back. But really, it's those middle transferable skills, the human parts of you, the things that go beyond just a legal background that open doors into these other different areas, different from traditional practice. All right. Uh, let's look out to the next screen for a second. Um, I, I laugh. Some people use cartoons in their speeches, so I always look for funny cocktail napkins. And I think that uh, Marilyn Monroe's answer, that what the hell is always the right answer, is very cute on a cocktail napkin. But it's not the right answer when somebody says, gee, what would you uh, prefer to do for your next career? How would you prefer to use your JD? What the hell is not going to get you to the place you want to go? But one thing that might is knowing who you are and what exactly it is that interests you. So if we advance this the frame again, what you're going to see is a kind of wide-ranging uh, list of some of, not all of, but some of the things that lawyers have been known to do. Now, I, I debated over whether putting this in the program because 
what happens is as soon as you give a list to people of this is what you can do with a law degree, people start to think of it as a final list. And in fact, this is only a small number of the kinds of things I have seen lawyers go into. There is no magic list because there's no one thing you can do with a law degree. It's who you are, what you bring to the law degree that opens up possibilities. But, but I do think it's interesting to note that, and this wasn't my chart, I found this someplace, so somebody else is also agreeing with me that these are just some of the things, right? Law enforcement, uh, policy work, sales work, uh, intellectual property, doing something that feeds off of an interest in international, uh, working in an energy industry, doing something with contracts, government, civil rights, administrative work, the arts. I've had lots of clients really interested in doing something that's more art focused. How do they get there, right? Any of these ideas, if they are a good start for you, oh, wait, let's go back one second to stay on it. Thank you. Any of these ideas, if they jumpstart your uh, your thought process, is great, but it's not a be-all and the end-all. If you find any of these that sound interesting, good. Note them down. That's your one learning for today because we're going to talk about how we can get more information on these. But I just want to give you an idea of the breadth of things that you can do, and it's really not limited to what anybody else says someone has done with a law degree. It's more about what interests you. Okay, now let's move ahead and say why I say it's easy, but other people think this is hard. Uh, initially, I, I did a study for NALP, which is the National Association for Law Placement, on why it was difficult for school career services offices to help uh, law students who are coming in asking about alternative careers. So some of these um, responses do not really apply to, to our audience today, but I want you to look at the biggest chunk of people who said why it was difficult to counsel students on alternative careers. And it said because the students themselves had a lack of self-awareness. So that's right in the middle there. There's kind of the brown line. One who is looking to move careers has the hardest job of all, right? Because you have to be able to look at yourself in the mirror and say, what do I want to do? Maybe you don't know exactly. Maybe you just know you love sports, or you love medicine, or you love banking, or you love botany, or you love photography. That's a start. And as I indicated earlier, even though you might not be able to get to the center of that archery target, that those concentric circles, if you at least know the areas and industries that hold something for you, you're going to overcome that big difficulty, the lack of self-awareness. Things like, if you look through the list, too little time. It's hard. Uh, admittedly, it's really hard to be holding down a full-time law practice job and then say, well, in all my free time, haha, I'm going to be doing other exploration. Um, so I recognize that, but it's something that when you realize that you're very unhappy, that's we can find ways to carve out time out of the day. Lack of expertise, well, that to me is... Um, for the career services offices, I get it. They don't have a lot of experience in it. But for a lawyer who's looking to switch or transition, the lack of expertise is something we can definitely get you past as you start to learn more about new industries, about what it takes to succeed in those new industries, about where your skills as a lawyer really do count as transferable skills. For instance, let's say you wanted to uh, explore something in journalism. And you know that well. Journalists do a lot of writing, and I don't have I don't have journalistic writing experience. Well, but what you do have, most lawyers have, is a lot of legal writing experience. So the question isn't what's the missing expertise; it's what's the missing transferable component. How do I learn enough about what journalistic writing is so that I can figure out how to sell the fact that I know how to do legal writing? So yes, it's a concern, uh, but it's not a concern that we can't overcome. And the same is true with uh, with lack of resources. There are, and I, well, I'll list a few right now. Once you start to figure out what it is you want to do, it is amazing how many associations are available to you. So if you found that you had an interest in banking, I'll use that again, there's an, an, an association of bankers. Once you find that you have an interest in Marketing, there are associations of marketers, there are associations of human resource directors, and almost any industry that you could tell me you have an interest in has an association, both at the national level 
and at local levels whose function is to help people understand what that industry does. So even if you didn't know any other resource, if you could target a particular industry and find the trade association that supports that industry, boom, you've got a first line resource to begin to help you understand another industry. Uh, let's go on again. And uh, there's another one of my very favorite cocktail napkins. Um, yes, there are going to be obstacles in this, but if you don't overcome the obstacles, you're like this poor woman who, by happy, she means trapped with no means of escape. Uh, that is not anybody listening today. We have we have lots of ideas and lots of opportunities. So let's move on. When I think about changing the thinking about alternative careers, and this is not just for individuals, this is for the bar association, this is for law firms, this is for everybody. I believe that we got to get ourselves unplugged from the limited thinking that the only thing you can do with a law degree is, is practice law or that the natural thing, everybody knows is not the only thing. But I don't think the natural, immediate natural thing about a law degree is to go practice. We've got to get out of that limited thinking. And how we do that is by educating, by programs like this, by folks sending in questions. And, and by the way, I'm not seeing questions. So if you've got questions to, that you want uh, addressed, please type them in and let me see if I can help uh, help you expand your thinking. We can educate ourselves about the process. There's a certain amount of empowerment and again, programs like this and being able to connect with lawyers across the country, across demographics, across years of practice and know that they are all asking these same what else can I do kinds of questions should in and of itself be very empowering. And then I think we uh, both as individuals and of course as an industry need to evolve so that we start to see, and we can move to the next slide, that different jobs are in fact equivalent alternatives. So I don't know how many of you have recently had to retake the driver's test. Um, I, I have had to do that in the not too distant past and, past and past. And one of the things they remind you of, right, that when you are behind the wheel, you shouldn't drink at all, but that there are in fact equivalent uh, amounts of alcohol in a pint of beer and a six ounce pour of wine and a mixed drink. They are all three equally dangerous when you're driving. But another way to say that is they're really equivalents. They can be exchanged, interchanged for one another. I firmly believe that anything you do where you utilize the legal thinking process and the background that you have makes for an equivalent alternative. I don't think we need to say this is a JD job, this is an alternative to a JD job. They are in fact all ways of using your skills and your background. So when you think of what's an alternative for for us as an industry, I think we need to evolve and think about these all these jobs as equivalents. So one of the questions that did come in, and this is definitely fair, it goes back to the chart about what makes it hard to change jobs, is uh, what, is your, what is your advice to those of us who have fears related to massive amounts of student loan debt and switching careers? This is one of the problems, um, especially when people uh, make the decision to go into law school without really knowing if they want to do it at the end. It, it's costly. It's an investment. So I will tell you, I have had clients make career changes where they have, some have made huge uh, ex exchanges financially, but many have been able to continue a very nice standard of living doing something that they enjoy more. And that's, let's be fair, if somebody wants to go into the business world, that's easier to keep a more even financial playing field than if you decide that what you really want to do is to go into the nonprofit world. But not even jobs on the nonprofit side have a range of financial remuneration, right? So for instance, sometimes people who've had a very strong pull for a nonprofit have gone to work on the corporate side, but doing good work. An easy example in the Chicago market is like the Ronald McDonald House. If you wanted to go work for McDonald's, but you wanted to do it on the side that was helping kids and, and uh, making 
I don't know everything that Ronald McDonald House does, right? But I know that if you work for them, they have corporate structure and corporate hierarchies. So you could still do good work. You could still fulfill your need to be giving back and still make a salary that would allow you to help repay those loans. So just saying that I can't do it because of the money isn't a fair judgment. You've got to go figure out what you want and within what you want to do, what the range of salaries are. Um, let's go on to the next uh, slide for a second, and we'll come back to the questions in a minute. I love this cartoon um, because, you know, I, I, I'm guilty of thinking outside the box so much that I don't even know where the lines of the box end, any, end anymore. But this guy says to his cat, never, ever think outside the box. Um, so... This is the opposite of the advice I'm giving you, but hopefully it's going to put a smile on your face. Um, let's go to the sec next question. This is from an international LLM student doing corporate compliance and finding that it's difficult to, to find a job opportunities because she doesn't have experience in compliance. Okay, so that's a fair question. Anytime somebody's looking to hire somebody, one of the questions is always, well, what are you going to be able to give me? How are you going to add value to my organization? So one of the things that, uh, that this questioner has is the newly minted degree. I don't know where you are in your program, but it's certainly possible if you're doing this, if there's a, either a summer opportunity to do an internship or there's an externship to work in corporate compliance while you're in school, that would be one really good way of getting experience. Another would be if you understand enough about what a compliance role is to be able to go back to things that you have done in the past and pull out the kinds of tasks that you were that you accomplished in your former job and be able to align those with what a co corporate compliance job entails so that you can convince new employers, new hirers, that even though you've really just now got the degree, you've been working in those areas or working in related areas. So this is a, a personalized, that how everybody sells themselves individually is a very personal piece of the process. But the idea that you can pull off your background and say, I didn't have this exact experience, but here's something similar. And let me tell you how one is very much like the other is something that lawyers can do. That's something we learn in law school. We learn how to take something that's not exactly on point and make it apply. That skill is very beneficial in a job search as well. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. Um, what I'm going to tell you next is sometimes counterintuitive because we're going to talk about that very first step, that self-assessment step. And I know that we are all involved with other people and we want to please our significant others and if our parents were the ones that footed the bill for law school we want to listen to what they say but when it comes to career change I think the lady with the pie says it all the she didn't ask for somebody else's opinion and when it comes to self-assessment what you think and what you care about is the single most important thing so let's flip the slides um, and I'll, I'll take it to my best favorite recipe for alternative career counseling. Start at the bottom of this really um, attractive beer pint, right? Self-assessment is the first and most important piece of the recipe for career counseling. Who are you? What do you care about? What do you want to do? What industry do you want it to be in? How do you want to feel at the end of the day? What kinds of people do you want to work with? There are so many questions. And unfortunately, I think many of us go to law school without either without knowing those answers or without having thought about those answers. Um, I love this chart because it looks so delicious, but I have to say I probably should have reallocated the uh, Self-assessment may be just one part of it, but it's a really, really important part. Uh, let's hold off for a second. I see a question just popped up. Uh, I'm a 2L and not quite sure if I'd like to pursue an alternative career. Is it okay to look for non-legal internships for my summer or 3L semesters? Uh, okay, that is a really good question, and I think I would direct us back to the self-assessment part of the mug. 
if you know that you really aren't sure that, that an alternative career is really part of what you're contemplating, I think you owe it to yourself to have some kind of a non-legal experience, whether you want to do it during your third year as an externship, rather than taking a summer away from a law opportunity. If you're really on the fence, uh, the advantage of a second L, a 2L summer is that maybe there'll be a, an offer to practice law that comes out of that. But if you only have law experience, when you go to tell somebody on the alternative side that you really don't want to practice law, you won't have any experience or um, anything in writing on your resume to back you up. So I would say try to work that in, um, but it doesn't have to be your summer job. Okay, going back to the mug. One part self-assessment, an all-important first part. And be honest. Remember I said, to, we talked about the lady with the pie when she said, um, funny, I didn't ask for your opinion. In the case of self-assessment, it's only your opinion that matters. Now, you may want to tailor that to uh, fit the realities of the situation, right? If you live in... Idaho and you really, really want to move, want to be in Hollywood and be in the movie industry, but you're not willing to move to California, we have a sort of a disconnect that we have to work on, right? So there is some reality that has to enter into your self-assessment, but you start with, what do I like? What do I care about? Where are my interests? What would I love to do every day? I promise you, nobody goes off crazy end and finds something that's totally unrelated to their financial needs, their realistic abilities, but it's a great place to start, okay? Once we have some self-assessment, some idea of who we are, what we want, what's important, what our values are, then those composites help direct us toward which markets would we really like to put our energies to work in. So when I say market assessment, I'm thinking really broad, bro broad brush strokes again. Like, I like sports. I like business. I really want to give something back. You do not have to know at this stage, at the second quarter of the mug, exactly what the job is, what the title is, what you will be paid, who's going to hire you. You can't be expected to know that. And if you're looking that specifically at the details, you're circumventing the, the process. You're not giving yourself enough chance to think broadly. Okay? So who you are comes first. Then you build on that with what kinds of markets, areas, industries, even locations would allow me to do some of the stuff that I like based on the assessment mode. Once you've overlaid the markets, the particular areas, the particular career arenas on top of who you are, then you're ready to get into the resourcing and networking, which I've got as sort of the third tier of the mug. That's when you're digging down. That's when you're finding people who are in a field, asking them questions about what they do, learning about how they, especially if, if you know another lawyer who's transitioned, how that person made the move from law to mixology or law to marketing or law to photography or fill in the blank, law to restaurateurs, right? There's information to be gathered. And that information gathering is incredibly important because one, you got to know that you're really going in a good direction. You could find out during the networking that the market that you thought you like really would be a terrible fit for you. And I'll give you an example of that. But it's also so that you can become a better candidate because you'll have a better understanding of what that new area or industry might be. So here's, here's an example. A long time ago, I had a client come in. I was a woman, and she said, I want to be a teacher. And I went, wow, you know, usually my clients want to talk more about their background and figure out together. No, she says, I want to be a teacher. I said, okay. So I start to push back a little bit. And I said, well, gee, do you really like working with children? No, I, I don't particularly like children. I said, okay, well, you know, I'm thinking maybe she wants to teach at higher levels. And I said, well, you know, do you like training and, and uh, explaining things, re-explaining things in different ways so different people can understand? She said, no, I'm really, I don't like public speaking. Okay, so now I'm starting to get really confused, right? She doesn't like children. She doesn't like uh, different demographics. She doesn't like public speaking. 
finally she announces in, in kind of a very agitated voice, I want my summers off. Okay, I get that. Wanting your summers off is perfectly legit to say, you know, I, I feel that I've overworked her. But that doesn't mean that teaching would be the right field for her. She would have been, I think, miserable and probably a miserable educator as well. But the the networking, asking questions about an industry and realizing that you might not like everything in it is part of that process of going back. Maybe I need to re-self-assess again. Uh, a new, uh, let me go to the questions for a second. Um, somebody asks, uh, is it, do I advise law students to seriously research other career options while in school? And if so, what point? I always think we should be asking about what else we can do and who else we are and what else might make a fit for us. I don't think it's limited to when you're in school, but you're always comparing one against the other. If you're in school and you have a summer job or an externship with a law firm, ask yourself, what am I enjoying about this? Is it the intellectual challenge? Is it the fast pace? Uh, is it that it's so detail-oriented? Whereas if you're working another job in another, uh, let's say, a, a government position or a business position, what do I like about this job? And always have that self-assessment sort of right down the middle of the page so that you can compare the qualities of job A to who you are and the qualities of job B to who you are and see where there's a better fit. S lawyers are smart people. You've proven yourself. You wouldn't be sitting on this call if you hadn't already shown that you've got a lot of smarts and a lot of discipline and a lot of stick to -itiveness. Sometimes that works against you. Sometimes you can t convince yourself that you can stand anything just because you're qualified to do it. My approach is really different. My approach is start with the self-assessment. Start with who you are and what you are and what makes you feel good about the skills that you were sort of born with, what I'd call your transferable skills, and see where they best apply. And again, I go back to the lady with the pie. I, I don't have to necessarily ask anybody else about that. I might have to ask somebody else about, you know, whether XYZ is a good firm to work for, or, but I know inside what makes me feel good and what makes me feel like I'm using the best of me. And that's what I want each of you to be able to say when you look at alternative careers. Am I using the best parts of me? Am I really being, uh, if not 100%, 90% engaged in what I do? So let's go back to the mug for a second. We start with that all-important self-assessment. We go into the markets and try to figure out, is the market really what I thought it was? We talk to people. We network. We do the learning. And this is maybe where you talk to trade associations and verify that, in fact, what you want, what the market offers is an overlap. And then you get to the, to the foam on top. Then it's time for the bells and whistles and the sales and marketing. That's when you're going to rewrite your resume. That's when you're going to think about, how am I going to market myself as something other than a traditional JD? I'd argue that even if you, would, if you think you'd feel better doing rewriting resume way down at the bottom of the mug, it would be a mistake. Because you can't tell a new industry what it is that you offer them until you've, done, until you've gone down from the bottom of the mug up. You can't tell somebody in sales why you have what they want if you don't know yourself that you have it, if you don't know that the market requires it, if you haven't talked to several people in that industry who can help you use the right words that that industry uses, right? So the reason that my mug builds up the way it does is because these are the foundations. These are the, the pieces that one has to layer on top of each other. And I have... I've been using this model for a long time, guys, and I've seen it work over and over and over again. This is the best way to begin to consider how are you going to build this uh, alternative career cocktail. So let's move on for a second. The next couple of slides are all about how do you really get yourself going on that self-assessment piece. You know, I think it's it's easy to ask the questions, that's what I do for a living, but sometimes it's really hard. Maybe you don't know yourself that well. Maybe you haven't engaged in that much navel gazing, right? So here's a way to self-start that process. And I would uh, get out a clean piece of paper 
or I'd get a big glass of wine and a good friend, and I'd start saying, let's talk through these things and see uh, what do I know about myself. So what'd you study? That's a legitimate way to start. When you were an undergrad, were undergrad, did you love what you were studying? Why did you pick it? Was it because that's what your folks did or your siblings did? Or did you really have a passion for it when you thought, hey, it doesn't matter, I can study anything I want in undergrad? If you didn't pursue it, why not? I can't tell you how many people I talked to knew themselves better as an undergrad. They knew what they wanted. They knew why they chose a certain area of study. And then they didn't pursue it because sometimes rightly so and sometimes mistakenly so, they thought they couldn't make a living in it. Or somebody, fill in the blank, a spouse, a parent said, that's not good for you. But they never did the homework at that time to really learn why. And even if you loved what you did undergrad, but you don't want to go back and uh, you loved literature, you studied literature, and you realize now that being a, a literary uh, professor is not going to be the path you want, go back to my archery target visual and say, okay, who else dabbles in anything related to literature? Well, there's a huge publishing industry, right, where they need writers and they need editors and they need legal experts. Maybe you even, and I don't know how many people remember these from school, you do a Venn diagram, right, where you see where an overlap is between two different uh, areas. Maybe you try to do a little Venn diagram for yourself and say the world of publishing and the world of law must have some areas of overlap. Perhaps I could bring my undergraduate interest together with my law background and see where that goes. And then you think of legal publishing houses or you think of publishing houses that have legal issues, right, related to author contracts or uh, distribution agreements. And you start to realize that it's not as simple as I could practice law or I could write a book. There are definite overlaps between the markets, okay? Um, so then that's where I would start. Why did you choose to go to law school? I didn't know what else to do. I did well on the LSAT. My family's full of lawyers. I watched LA Law and I thought it was a cool show. I mean, I have heard every reason under the sun. And most of the people that find their way to me did not go to law school because it was something they were dying to do. Now, you could want, really want a law school and find out later on that it wasn't what you wanted. But you got to ask yourself, what were you hoping for? And then, if so, why did you go to a particular law school? And what did you turn down to go to law school? Did you forego an MBA? Did you forego a master's in health administration? Did you really, really want to go into med school, but it seemed too long of a path? These are hard questions because sometimes it's uh, bringing up an issue that's unpleasant, like what was the road not taken? But if you're not completely candid when you do this the beginnings of these self-assessments, you're going to get to the wrong place, right? So you got to be real honest with yourself. I think you need to review your prior work history, even stuff way back in high school jobs and camp counseling. And why did you like it? If you were really in the flow at some point in time, I'd be so curious to pull apart what it was about that specific experience that made you feel great. Was it working with kids? Was it being outdoors? Was it working with your hands? Was it being able to uh, to help the neighborhood? Was it the fact that you sold more Cutco knives than anybody in the history of your uh, region and it felt really good? There's some, we are more, this is another personal belief, right? But we're more the people we were then before we went to law school and got all these other highfalutin ideas of what we should do. We were more ourselves earlier on. So I'm trying to get you back closer to that. And, of course, number four under self-starter, ask people. Ask your parents. Ask your siblings. Ask your good friends. What did they think you were going to go into? Ask, look in your high school yearbook, for heaven's sakes. People thought you were going to be what? The next president? Uh, the next, uh, you know, surgeon general? If people saw you a certain way, there might be a reason. And there might be a hint in that of who you are. And that hint 
might be enough to get you pursuing or looking into or at least researching different industries. Let's go to the next slide. After you've asked yourself all those tough, tough questions on the prior page, ask some easy ones. What do you like to do? How do you like to spend your free time? Um, what are some of the values that you find really important? If making money is really important to you, that's great. This is not a judgment question. But it is a question about what do you need to get back to feel good every day that you're in the office, right? Um, I think too many times we get caught up in what we should do or what you know, we thought the right career path was out of law school instead of this is what makes me tick. This is what's really important. I know that when I, whether I hand somebody a, a cocktail that I've mixed for them or we finish an hour session and they have a smile on their face and they feel hopeful about something, that is incredibly satisfying to me. So at the end of the day, I don't want to be in a business that makes people feel sad or depressed. I want to uplift folks. That's part of what's important in my personal values. Um, I almost went into the ice cream business. That's for a whole nother seminar, but ben, meeting Ben and Jerry <laughs> of Ben and Jerry's ice cream and seeing how much joy they gave to people and how much fun it was to be part of that industry was, was definitely um, a part of what I remember thinking, boy, I don't want to practice law. I want to serve people ice cream cones. That's fun. That makes them smile. So I didn't do that, uh, but I will tell you that was instrumental in my leaving law to go to craft and uh, get into the brand management game. So if anybody wants more information, send me questions, and I'll tell you about that. What are the top elements you want from a job or a career? Have you really thought about that? Yeah, I, everybody wants to be able to put a roof over their head and, and food on the table. That's a huge part of why you work. But ask yourself, and it kind of goes along with values, what else are you looking for? What's the takeaway you want? What do you want to be able to say? I've heard some people put it in terms of what do you want at your eulogy, right? Uh, one uh, person years ago was motivated to come see me because he went to two, two funerals in one week. And the first funeral, somebody said, this guy was always at the office. This guy, you know, was willing to work till the wee hours of the morning. And the second funeral was this person gave back to the community. This person was always there when people needed her. And I remember my client was very sort of shocked at how those back-to-back -back experiences affected him and said, how do I want to be remembered? Not only is it okay for you to ask those questions, I think you have to. Same thing about what do you want to avoid in a job or a career. What don't you want? How don't you want to be remembered? Um, these are important. Uh, what dream jobs have you ever imagined for yourself? I love this question. You know, people will say, well, if I could do anything I want, I would blah, blah, blah. That to me is the seed to what you really, truly might want to do. Because the fantasy is easy, right? Yeah, if I could... If I could, I'd be Oprah, and I'd be on TV, and I'd tell everybody what I thought. But when you break that down, maybe it means you really want to be a thought leader, or you really want to be somebody who's exposed to a variety of different interesting people. So it's not that it's just a fantasy. It's the fantasy that maybe then we can break down and get to some reality. And the same thing with dream industries. You know, if you... If you think that aeronautics and space travel is so cool and you read about it as a hobby and that's what you really want to do, don't beat yourself up because you're not, uh, you know, a technical engineer. Say where within that industry can they use somebody like me who's good with words and concepts and communication skills. So just to sum up, there's a lot of different ways to look at whether you're in the law and whether you should be someplace else. And you can beat yourself up and say, you know, I went to law school and I'm unhappy and well, I'm, I'm doomed to this. Or as in the last slide, um, we can go ahead. Wait there. Hold on. Yeah, wait for it. When life hands you lemons, add vodka. That's clearly a mixologist's uh, way to look at it. But there are things that you can do. If 
you haven't taken away anything else from this program, and I really hope you have, and if you haven't, you're supposed to let me know. But I want to remind you that there are ways of recombining your background, your skills, your interests, your passions into other career areas, and within those other career areas, finding out where you fit. I'm going to go to that to the questions. We have a few more minutes, so now please send me any questions that we haven't addressed. Uh, and now the, one of the questions is, any advice for working parents looking for a career with work-life balance and or flexibility? That is something I hear a lot. Um, the concept that law is a jealous mistress is a quote that uh, I'm always reminded of because, you're, especially if you're on the clock, right, there's always more hours that you can bill. So one of the things that I would start with is the same self-assessment question. You know that you want a better balance. Where do you want to do it? Do you want a better balance within the law? There are all kinds of programs with uh, with firms now where you can go on a reduced hourly sort of a permanent associate lifestyle. Um, it's going to affect compensation, but of the clients that I've worked with who have done that, they found that they can still make a very nice living still be intellectually challenged, and still have time for the rest of their life. Uh, some of the temp uh, recruiters offer the same kinds of opportunities in the legal world. Do It's kind of like part of the gig economy. You work for either four days a week, or you work for a set period of time for a project, and then you have some time off in between. So that's another way that you can look at it. But recognizing that one of the values, one of the things you want is a better work-life balance becomes part of your self-assessment, and it becomes part of what's really important to you moving forward. Um, we, we talked a little bit about networking when we looked at the beer mug, right? But finding other people who have been able to establish a workable work-life balance and talking to them and asking them how they did it, how their industry was responsive to it, or their firm or their corporation will give you some really val valuable information that you can then use as you move on in your own search. So these kinds of uh, learning opportunities from other people who have already done it is, by the way, true for any of these questions. If you want to do something in a different industry, that's where networking comes in. If you want to do find somebody who's got a better work-life balance or found a way to work part-time or to go on a permanent associate track, find one of those people and ask them and learn from them. Uh, this is a very broad topic. Obviously, in an hour, we can only scratch the surface, but I am so pleased for all of you who are listening today and anybody who listens in the future that you're thinking about this. And I want to encourage you to be optimistic and know that I work with lawyers all the time who make these kinds of changes happily and successfully, and I am convinced that anybody who really wants to find an alternative from law, an, e an equivalent, equally good use of their time and their energies and probably more fulfilling at the end of the day can do it. So uh, I, I appreciate everybody listening in, and thank you all for your time. Thank you, Cheryl, and thanks for all those excellent analogies and techniques for self-assessment and identifying a fitting alternative legal career. And thank you all for attending today's program. Attendees, please be sure to check out our website at ambar.org forward slash careers for upcoming free career-related articles and webinars. Our next webinar in this career advice series is Shifting Your Interview Mindset on March 9th at 1 p.m. Eastern. And the next webinar that we have in the Career Choice series is on administrative law. You can also please you can also follow us on social media, um, and you can check out our job board for any for um, job postings. And you can learn more about our board at, on our about page. Thank you again for attending, and please be sure to fill out our survey before leaving. And everyone have a great day. <laughs>